Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're going to be getting started here in about a minute. See some people, uh, hear about some people signing on. So, um, first of all, thanks for joining us. I'm Jason Fisher. I'm the uh, District Extension Forester for Central District with Virginia Cooperative Extension. And uh, welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. Today's topic um, is on uh, hardwoods management using one of the tactics that's out there in the time today we'll go into one and maybe a follow-up to this later uh, and that's crop tree release uh, sometimes you hear the term uh, crown touching release or even chosen tree release so that word C we'll play with a little bit today but um, what we're essentially doing is is sharing uh, the formats going to be a few slides to to teach you a few concepts that you may or may not already know uh, so you understand what you're seeing when we get to the video. So in our short time today, we'll do a few slides uh, on the topic, and then I've got a walk in the woods that you can join me with that I have recorded, and that was videoed back in uh, early April, just before leaf out, where you could see a little better. And uh, our woods here now are pretty full, and uh, it still feels like late winter with the cold we've got coming up. So crop tree release, crown touch release, what is it, why it's important. So here we go. Um, what we're doing in this topic um, is essentially releasing the most desirable trees in a forest stand from less desirable trees based on landowner objectives. Um, and, it, and in essence, this will increase the tree health and overall vigor of the tree. Uh, you're allowing sunlight to the tree's crown, which will give you more photosynthesis, more growth, uh, more leaf production, more wood, et cetera. And so more is better, right? Uh, but essentially you'll see in the video later where uh, this does work and we've got some good research in Virginia and other states uh, that show that. Uh, some of the information you'll see today uh, I obtained from this crop tree field guide, uh, USDA Forest Service, Northeastern area. It's a 2001 publication. Uh, and you'll notice in the chat box here after a while, there'll be a resource for a publication I found for you uh, that you can use uh, out of North Carolina Extension. All right, so look at this picture for a second. This is the first concept I want you to understand is looking at the crown of a tree. So our crosshairs there in the middle, you see, we, we've essentially divided it from a bird's eye view uh, into four uh, distinct pie sections. If you can just remember those as four quarters um, or four sides, what we're trying to do is release that tree from competing trees on at least three of those four sides. Uh, and so in this case, the picture you're looking at, if you see uh, the number two, if you can focus on that, you can see there's a tree about that same color that's touching the crown of that tree. Uh, and that's okay. Um, uh, in an optimal situation like this, uh, slide will show um, here. You can see the free to grow rating is, is four. That's a word we use, so don't be thrown by that. Uh, foresters use that term free to grow. So a tree is optimally free to grow. Uh, the best situation is on all four sides, and that's the picture on the left. Um, on the right, we have a free to grow rating of three because three sides are released, but, but again, there's that tree again touching our crown. If you see the CT, uh, crown touching. Uh, in that case, this happens to be a crop tree. So there's another play on words. And you would want to keep that tree. It's okay to have two uh, chosen trees or crop trees close together. And sometimes you just have to make a choice. Um, how do you remove trees? Uh, what are your options? Okay. So I have three uh, to share with you today. Uh, they both, all three have their, their pros and, and cons. So the first one is girdling the tree, which is just what it sounds like. You, you saw into the tree bark or in a circle all the way around the tree, which cuts off all the sap flow. And you may do that twice. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Uh, the second option is cutting the tree completely down with a chainsaw. And option three, uh, some people use uh, herbicides if you choose to do that. And there's three methods that that can be done. Uh, and I'll show you a picture of that with uh, hack and squirt, basil bark, and cut stump. Uh, you can see those in a second. So we're either girdling the tree, cutting it down, 
or using herbicides uh, to kill the trees that we do not want. All right, so in looking at that, here's a, a picture I thought I'd share with you. So our crop tree over here on the right, see where my mouse is moving, um, is flagged in blue. That's the tree that we want to keep. That's our chosen tree. And in the front of you here, you see where we've girdled this tree. This is actual site we did some research in in, in Southern Piedmont. And you see the two girdles on this red maple uh, where we cut it with a chainsaw. And then on the left, we just cut that one completely down. Um, so we were actually tampering to see what those different methods would do. Well, just so happens we came back in three years and look at this picture. Sometimes girdling with a chainsaw may not work at all. And in this case, this tree recovered. It grew through it, which, you know, can happen. So that just shows it's not 100%. Cutting the tree down is probably 100%, but there's more liability involved with that. So, you know, speaking of that, um, you can see I've got a picture thrown in here. If you're going to, you know, choose to cut a tree, um, make sure you have your personal protective equipment on. You can see the orange chainsaw chaps. Um, those are the strap-on. Make sure they're tight. Uh, they will work, they're affordable, but the best one's actually a, a pants style. Uh, you can see gloves there, and if you can see the head on this person who um, I did not get permission to use that, so uh, they were with me, but uh, they would have a hard hat and safety glasses on. Uh, the pros and cons of herbicides, I mean, we understand girdling, we understand cutting it down, but let me quickly go through those. There are some disadvantages with herbicides. One, some folks just may not want to do it. Don't want to use herbicides, chemicals, that's fine. Uh, how far you are from water or a forested buffer, you know, distance away from water, uh, may be an issue um, that you're concerned about. It may be cost prohibitive, herbicides are expensive. And then translocation, that just essentially means if you can imagine the roots of a tree grafting together under the ground, sometimes that herbicide could translocate between trees and you may actually harm or kill a tree that you don't mean to, uh, that's a downside of herbicides. Now the upsides, I put a couple, uh, obviously less physical risk because you're not using a chainsaw. And quite frankly, I'm not recommending that everyone watching this or you know, use a chainsaw. Uh, so the risk there, you remove that, uh, so to speak, uh, as long as you're wearing your protective equipment and using the herbicides, such as your rubber gloves and, and long sleeve shirt and pants. And then the timing of application. So typically you use herbicides, you can use them in the winter time when ticks and heat are less a factor. Uh, and so left to right, you can see in this picture, I have the hack and squirt. And you notice that blue dye, that's just something that we use a lot of times in our backpack sprayers and we recommend people use to uh, make efficient use of the herbicides. You don't use too much. You can see where you're spraying. Uh, and essentially you're hacking into the tree making cuts all the way around and using a squirt bottle, if you will, and squirting the herbicide in that uh, to kill the tree. And that's usually doing, done in the dormant season, which is typically December through March, uh, before sap rise. The middle picture is basal bark spray. You can see you're spraying the lower 18 inches of the tree, uh, also a wintertime application. And then lastly, on the right, most labels say, um, if a tree is eight inches in diameter or bigger, so you can picture a coffee can, that's about eight inches across, pretty good size one. Um, you, you have to use the cut stump method because the basil bark's just not as effective. So the label will tell you what you need to do. Virginia is a label law state, follow the label. So those are your herbicide options. And translocation, I said I'd come back to that. Just look at this picture for a real quick second. Uh, you'll see the root system of a tree goes far beyond the drip line, at least for a tree that's grown a few years. And so that's where, you know, essentially the tree that you may treat with an herbicide, its roots are close to, uh, particularly in the same species, we've seen red maple graft and root graft. And so um, you may actually uh, kill more than you'd like. So be aware of that, consider your options, give it some thought. Let's go for a walk because I've talked enough uh, on the PowerPoint part. We're going to switch gears and go for a short walk in the woods and show these concepts I've just talked about. And I've uh, got an interview here with Dean Cumbia. He's the forest manager for Virginia Department of Forestry's uh, Management Division. Okay.
Okay, good afternoon, everybody. This is Jason Fisher, Extension Forester for Southside. We're in private property down here in Southern Virginia. And you see behind me, we've got a young hardwood stand, about 28 years old, that was clear cut and uh, came back natural. And with me today is Dean Cumbia, uh, who's in charge of forest management for Virginia Department of Forestry. And I've asked Dean to join me briefly and share a little bit about Virginia's hardwood initiative with crop tree release being one of the components of that. Dean, welcome. Thank you, Jason. It's so good to be with you. It's springtime is a great time to be in the woods and to look at your forest and see what the forest can offer for you because there's so many benefits. We're talking about hardwoods today. These are deciduous trees, the trees that lose their leaves in, in the uh, winter time, but they're starting to grow now and starting to bud out now. Uh, the Department of Forestry and other, other interested partners in Virginia are launching a, a hardwood management initiative. Uh, our hardwoods cover 80% of the forests of Virginia, and uh, they actually need some good management. And today we're looking at one of the management practices uh, that can be implemented on a young stand is to select the best trees, what we call our, our crop trees, uh, that would be our best timber trees, our best wildlife trees, our healthiest trees, and to give them some room to grow. It's uh, akin to weeding your garden. So uh, pick your best trees, and then uh, trees that are competing with that tree, we would take those out and uh, allow the tops or the crowns of our crop trees to grow and flourish. Uh, and you just be surprised. We all think that oaks grow slowly, but with room to grow, they will grow very well and very quickly, and it'll be much healthier. Provide many more things. They will, will bear uh, abundant acorns uh, and uh, be very uh, valuable in the future of your forest. And you can see this tree here above, Dean. You can see the crown. And we'll show a picture here shortly that shows releasing that crown. You can see this tree is pretty much free to grow on two sides. You can see the tree to the left, which is a red oak, tree to the right, which is another white oak. But we've uh, released this tree by removing this pine that was covering sunlight on this west slope that I'm standing on. Then you can see some red maples at the base of uh, Dean right here, because one of the goals this landowner has is hunting. And there's a lot of research that supports uh, brows of uh, shoots from like red maple that are very nutritious for does that are fixing the fawn. Um, a lot of information out there to support that. And so I'll pan around real quick from Dean here. You can see around us, I've got a blue flag there in the background with a control tree that we did not release and there's a number of white oaks around us of different varying quality. We've tried to flag those that have good form um, and where I'm standing now, we're probably looking at uh, flagging anywhere from three to uh, eight trees to the acre. Just depends on the stocking. You can see some pink flagging around me and throughout the stand. So again, this stand is 28 years old and the trees are starting to exhibit dominance. That generally happens from age 20. Uh, would you say, Dean, to, to age 28 or 30, about like this? And so Mother Nature is telling you which trees have good genetics that you can release. And we're seeing growth rates. We just measured a track this morning. Uh, we're seeing in three years' time, we're seeing an inch, inch and a half uh, growth on white oaks, right? Um, and so that's excellent. And that's what we want to see. The trees are healthier. And that's what we're doing, essentially stand improvement. And we're releasing these trees of value and choice uh, to be free to grow. Thank you, Dean. Good to be here with you, Jason. Now, in taking a closer look, this is a control tree. I put blue flagging on these, and you can see the aluminum nail and tagging with the number. So when we come back years from now, we can see how this tree has grown that has not been released as compared to our trees that we just looked at a second ago with pink flagging in the bottom that have been released. So that's what we're doing. We're just seeing what would happen uh, if we did nothing uh, and just let things grow, which is fine, uh, versus possibly taking advantage of um, good physical exercise, number one, but also uh, maybe cost share and incentives should they come and we have the work crews to help us. Uh, we can find many stands like this in Southside Virginia. Um, 
that are coming back even aged and I have good potential. And so walk with me up here on the ridge and we'll look back and you can see the history of this site was a old tobacco farm. Um, and the rows, you can still see the rows in the woods. We'll turn around here in a second and I'll show you that um, where the old fields were. And so here the hardwoods meet up to the pines. You can see the, the tops of the pines here, very typical south side Virginia, maybe in your area you'll have a different uh, type of yellow pine, but these are Virginia pine. There's a few short leaf mixed in there. And when I said earlier about the age of the stand, you can core a tree and not have to cut it down. But since we cut this one down, this is where we got that count from. And so if you look on this stump, softwoods give a really good picture where you can count the rings clearly and we've got about 28 rings here. And so this pine was cut in order to release this white oak right here behind it that you see flagged. And so what I'm seeing in this stand is the white oaks that we're releasing are about half the diameter of uh, these, these faster growing pines, which is about right. So in essence, the pines have created a little bit of a shelter for the hardwoods to come in, which is typical in succession. And succession is just, uh, if you left a field alone and didn't mow it and it turned back into forest, there's a lot of land doing that. Um, basically, hardwoods come in over time, uh, whether squirrels plant them, birds plant them, or they come back from the stump from where they were severed when it was harvested. So. Uh, this stand right here in years to come, uh, pan down through here before we finish up, you can see hopefully it's going to produce not only good acorns and mass for wildlife, but also be of timber value for the next owner and succeeding owner. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Uh, so that wraps up um, crop tree release, and I um, appreciate you all joining us today. I do want to take a moment to see if there are any, uh, if you got any questions, put those in the chat box. We'll be glad to answer those. I do want to announce that next week's topic is bottomland hardwoods. You see that on the screen. Uh, there's some information there as well. If you uh, find you have a question when this is over and want to email me or, or call, I'd be happy to help you out and share some information with you.